things that are going on. Uh, you may have heard also baby Sasha is ill right now. Um, keep her in prayer. And uh, Brother Keith Hale just came to us right before the service. He said, my uh, father-in-law just died. So I'm leaving right now. And they're going up. The whole Hales family are going up there. Um, so all of that just happened. <laughs> And uh, this is a habit. I don't know. Satan just hates this church. He hates it. And he attacks and he works with things just so that right before service time, all this stuff happens. And uh, today, now, let me ask you, does that mean God's not on the throne? <laughs> God is to be glorified. Jesus is to be praised. At the name of Christ, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. That Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of God the Father. But these things must come to pass. In fact, we're going to talk about this in Luke chapter 11 today. These things must come to pass so that Christ is glorified even higher than we can imagine. And so uh, keep praying. Keep praying. Brother, come if you will and uh, just pray for these families. Pray for those that are going through things. Pray for my, you know, the Hales. They're part of our family too. Why do we pray? We pray because our Father in Heaven wants to have a conversation with each and every one of us. He not only wants to know when we're happy, but He wants to know when we're sad. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, please. Father, today we pray that those are troubled, ill health, and those that have lost loved ones as in Keith Hale and his family have, we pray for them. We pray for their travel. We pray for their sickness. We pray for their healing. We pray that those who are there to help them will be blessed by you because only through you does their knowledge and their ability come. In your son's name, amen. 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 I don't know if there's a rain coming. I think maybe. I hope and pray there is. But in any case, uh, the hails, uh, pardon me, the O'Days are out because of uh, an emergency harvest. And so keep them in prayers while they're going through uh, sort of a up, up against the wall type thing right now. So you keep them in prayer as well. Brother Mark, come on up here, man. You guys love Brother Mark Bishop, man. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Guide us in the welcome time. Good morning. Um, do we have any first time visitors this morning? If you would, raise your hand. Ah, there's a couple, and then, oh, oh, you guys are just playing. All right. <laughs> what, I'd, what I'd like to do is just a little personal thing that happened when, when uh, Pastor Barry was up here, and that is focus your hearts on, on these people that we're praying for this, this hour, the, yeah. the people that, have, that are having these, these issues right at church time. Mm -hmm. Let's pray for them and lift them up. Let's focus yeah. our hearts. Um, will you warmly greet your neighbors? Amen. And just walk yeah. around and say hello to everybody? Say hi to somebody. And yeah, that's awesome. Welcome Praise them warmly. The you need to do that more. <laughs> you need to do that more. You're, you're good. You're good. I like it. Rock of Ages, Rock of Ages, brother, uh, brother Jack, Rock of Ages.
Hey everybody, just sing Rock of Ages. We're going to sing Rock of Ages, my friends. We'll sing it out together. Rock of Ages, left for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. Could my tears forever flow? Could my zeal no languor know? These for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. In my hands no price I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. We're going to segue right into him 508. Love lifted me. Sing it out, dear ones. Love lifted me. Praise Lift Lifting up, right? Lift it up. Yeah. <laughs> I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. Very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry from the waters lifted me now say am i love lifted me love lifted me when nothing else could help love lifted me love lifted me love lifted me when nothing else could help, love lifted me. Hey, hold on a second, guys. I know everybody's down to a certain degree, and we got family that's hurting right now. But if you can, let's try to lift up, you know, because they need us right now. They need that encouraging smile on the face, right? Yeah. To be there for somebody right now. Yeah. I'm glad for you guys when you were there for me, when I had some family passed away, right? Yeah. yeah. And so let's uh, lift up, right? Love lifted me. Verse number two. All my heart to him I give, ever to him I'll cling. In his blessed presence live, ever his praises sing. Love so mighty and so true, merits my soul's best songs. Faithful, loving service to, to him belong. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Souls in danger, look above, Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by his love, out of the angry ways. He's the master of the sea, billows his will obey. He, your Savior, wants to be, be saved today. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted me, love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help, Love lifted me. Hey, have a seat and watch this. Watch this. We are called to rest. It's true. To set down our burdens. To stop. 
to worship our sleepless God. By trusting Him to provide, well, we do nothing. But rest must have its end. This body is made to move, to work, to go. The church at rest from her labor is beautiful in His eyes. But the church in motion, we are His hands, His feet. We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to worship Him with exactly the good works He made us to do. Let us not rest too long and miss the opportunity to discover our place in His plan. Let us rise up now and go. I'm grateful to report to you that there's two missions bulbs that we get to light. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. That was very, very much unexpected. Uh, again, just pray for the circumstances going on. Uh, I guess you might know also uh, Richard and Robin are out. You've seen that. I'm not sure what we're doing for the children's thing. Do you know? Yeah. Do you? Yeah, we'll, we'll have it. Oh, will you? If you want to. Okay, yeah, I, I want to for sure. I want to. Uh, I'm sorry about chewing when I got up here. I didn't have any breakfast this morning, and that wasn't a good idea. I was feeling a little weird. Now I feel a lot better. I ate a little apple there. <laughs> All right. Um, Tithes and offerings. Chris, come on up if you will. Hey, and praise the Lord also, the building fund. We're almost to a point where we're right at $400,000. So you've given about $425,000 to the building fund since we started that campaign. And uh, right now we're only that far away from our goal for the entire building. So I praise the Lord for that. Chris, come on, my brother. Thank you so much. Good morning. If I could have the ushers come up when they're ready. Um, it is a beautiful morning. Um, you know, things can be so bleak and, and hard on us at times, but we know that God is with us, and He wants us to pray to Him and reach out to Him and talk to Him. And I didn't mean to pour water on the service, y'all, cold water. I don't want to do that. Just, you know, a bunch of stuff happened, I felt like I need to tell you, and we need to be in prayer. So I hope, hope it didn't seem that way to you. Yeah, sorry. I pray for the tithes. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for so much that you give, Lord. Your grace and your mercy is more than we deserve, Lord. Uh, we just pray that today hearts would be touched and that what they can give can be a blessing to this church, Lord, and that we can use it to spread your gospel, Lord. Time is of the essence, and it's our duty to let people know that they could go to hell. They need to repent and ask for forgiveness, Lord. And we pray that this service, uh, that you would be here with us, Lord, and that you would just fill our hearts and uh, to just let us be cheerful givers, Lord, and just give the pastor what he needs to feed us, Lord. And uh, we ask this in your son's name. Amen. 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 Yeah. I realize sickness and pestilence and death and all of that doesn't all come just because of Satan, you know. Uh, the Word tells us our flesh is also a culprit. 
And of course, because of our sin, the things that are going on are going on. But I just praise the Lord for His grace, don't you? Amen. Praise His name for that. I have some good news for you too. I don't know if he's back just yet, but uh, he's, he went to take some medicine. I had to take some medicine, uh, regular medicine. He just wanted to be here for Sunday school. But Vince Joy gave his heart to Christ yesterday, Amen. which is an immense, immense blessing, isn't it? He was, uh, he is, uh, you know, he's, he's told us over and over again, long time uh, Catholic. And uh, he just said, I, you know, I went to my priest. I asked him, I said, how can I be sure I'm going to heaven? He said, Vince, not even the Pope is sure. That's what he said. So he came into my office yesterday and he said, how can I be sure I'm going to heaven? And I showed him from the scriptures, 1 John 5, 13 says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. And the Pope ought to look at the Vaticanus because it says the same thing in his Bible. But I don't understand these people that have these weird beliefs. i got to tell you something. Whether you're Catholic or Mormon or Baptist or whatever, you can miss heaven by 18 inches from here to there. And Vince just wasn't going to miss. And he got down on his knees and in tears gave his heart to Jesus in a very special way. Several were given the gospel yesterday. Several went out. Twenty-three people were on yesterday's Super Saturday Evangelism, which was just phenomenal. And they were all over. I don't even think we saw each other all that much. We were all over this neighborhood. But I think we got to everywhere. And there were some great, you had some good open people too, didn't you? And I was able to talk to a man named Noah about the full gospel. He, he was very patient right there in what, 95 degree weather, uh, allowed me to give the full gospel to him. So that was a blessing as well. There's so many other things I could tell you that are a blessing. And I want to. I want you to know God is good. You know, hard things happen, but great things happen too. You know what I'm saying? So we bless the Lord for that. Guess what's coming up? The great jungle journey. Look at this right here. Great Jungle Journey. Put that up, if you will, if you got it, uh, Brother uh, Jack. And these things are all over the building, all right? So grab a hold of them, get them out to everybody. Let me see if I can get a couple of young men. You know who I want to see up here is Austin Horseman. Where is he? Huh? Oh, he's back there working. Never mind. You want to give these out to people? Do you want to do that? All right. Hey, be careful because they're really slippery and they fall real easy. So you want to hold on to them. You can give three and four and five to as many people as you want. Man, I'll tell you what. You guys are smart. Look at that. Hey, be careful because they're kind of slick, okay? They might fall out of your hand. Get those out to everybody. Start with, start with Marianne. She wants to be the head chef during the... Right? Yeah, okay. Hey, listen. Everybody and anybody, you can be involved in the VBS. And I hope that you will be. It's a great time, an exciting time, just great things going on all the time. How many of you got a bulletin this morning? Show me your bulletin if you got your bulletin. Put that up. There you go. Good, good, good. You see right there on that one page, you can go right down through there and see a deacons meeting. You guys that are deacons, we're going to meet on June the 30th, not tonight, but next week. Camp this week. My wife is going. You pray for the campers. And pray for the teen campers. On July the 3rd, look at this. July the 3rd. Man, you guys are doing good signing up. There's already a couple pages and this one's starting to fill up as well. But bring food, bring fireworks, and, uh, and bring, bring, uh, bring, bring, bring hoses. So, <laughs> in any case, that's, that's for July the 3rd. Great fun, great time together, great games, great fellowship. July the 6th is our next Super Saturday Evangelism. Next Super Saturday Evangelism right there if you want to sign up. July the 3rd is during the service. It's going to be about 6 o'clock we're going to start. And then afterwards is when we do the fireworks, of course, because you get a little bit dark outside, you know, about 8.30 or so. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, okay, we'll start. We'll, we can do some before just for you. <laughs> some of you guys want to go home early. We'll start some fireworks before the service, all right? Uh, Vince, hey, guess what? Vince already told me he's getting baptized on June the 30th. Think of that. 
And I know of two others as well. That's exciting. So God is doing some great things. Trustees meeting is July the 7th. Trustees meeting is July the 7th. And then Abriella wants to invite you. Is Abriella around? No, she's out there. Abriella wants to invite you to her first birthday. Yesterday, by the way, Rajni, that was just an amazing time. David, that was an amazing time. Great group of people, maybe 40 or 50 people came to, uh, to little Elle's birthday, her first birthday. So this one is on the 7th, after the Sunday night service, or before, pardon me, at 5 o'clock, Sunday, July the 7th, for a cupcake to celebrate a time together. Not just having a cupcake, Abriella's little party, okay? You see that on there as well. And then you've got the deep cleaning on July the 12th. And then Brother Michael has got the Outside the Box Talent Show on July 26th. That night, some people are kind of staying later. They're going to do some outside activities, play some basketball, maybe even do a barbecue or so. Mark Bishop, who is our outside guy, probably will be involved. Mark Bishop is our new outside activities director. So get with Mark if you want to, talk with him. You've got people in the kitchen, people in different places. Just an awesome thing watching how God is blessing. Jose, I hope this isn't embarrassing, but I love you. I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> what a blessing you are, man. Brother Tijerina is here. Praise the Lord for that. His great family. The Lord is doing great things this morning. Bless his holy name. All right, the missions conference is coming up. Amen. Do you know what that means? It means I need a missions commission. I need a missions commission. A group of people who love missionaries, like to decorate, like to plan for trips, because we're going to have day trips during this missions conference, like missionaries in general, they like playing games, they like uh, planning services and all. How many of you would say, I'd kind of like to be on something like that? All right, good, great. Let me see, somebody else? Yes, ma'am, I got gotcha. you. All right, good. Somebody else? Who else? Let's see. Did I see two, three hands or two hands? Let me see. And now, Okay, I see you guys also, praise the Lord. Anybody else? Oh, that's okay. I'll put you on here, and we'll put you through the phone if we need to on the, meet, on the meetings. But the planning meetings, the first one is going to be July the 31st, okay? Got plenty of time to think about it. First planning meeting for commissions, for missions commissions, is July the 31st. So please be here. Now, tonight, here's a big one. Tonight, next thing coming up. Of course, you know sometimes evening services are bigger than morning services. Tonight... Little hands and big hearts are doing their thing. And then there'll be four biblical methods for having God fully answer my prayers. Four biblical methods for having God fully answer my prayer. One of the four is to have Angel Matt pray for you. You know, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But I tell you, there are some prayer warriors out there that can pray and I'll say, Good night. That thing came to be again. That individual really helped again. God, Toy Jones, another one of those. Just praying and the Lord just does things and she'll say, so did that work out? And I'm like, well, yeah, it did. Praise the Lord. So you guys, I've got some methods that they're using that I think that you'll be able to use. And you say, oh, wow, my prayers, my prayers were never answered. They felt like they were hitting the ceiling. I can give you some methods tonight that will help from Luke 11. Verses 9 through 13. You can look those up. Luke 11, verses 9 through 13. I'll be talking with the choir about some exciting methods for amplifying our music program. I'll be telling you about that later on, okay? But for now, my friends, stand up. And let's get ready to sing together. We're going to sing, my dear friends, this very next beautiful hymn. And you know it. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Hymn 510, as Pastor David guides us. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. After I'd wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend, He met the need of my heart. came down 
down and glory filled my soul when at the cross the Savior made me whole my sins were washed away and my night was turned to day heaven came down and glory filled my soul born of the spirit children you can go little guys you can go little children you can go and that transaction was quickly made when as a sinner i came took of the offer of grace he did proffer he saved me and praise his dear name glory He filled my soul. He made me whole. My sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down, and glory filled my soul. Amen. Amen. Now I have a hope that will surely endure after the passing of time. I have a future in heaven for sure, there in those mansions sublime. And just because of that wonderful day, when at the cross I believe, rich is eternal. Amen, yes. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole. Sing it. My sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Amen, amen. Have a seat. Have a seat. We're going to have a special right now. My sister's coming. Julia, where are you at? Is she? Are you ready, Julie, to sing? Julie, Julie, are you ready to sing? Julie, Julie, Julie. <laughs> I love you, Julie. <laughs> hey, everybody, uh, just so you know, on the back over here, uh, every six months, Barb and I reevaluate what we're doing and uh, how each week is broken up. And this time, I thought it would be wise to let you know our habit. And so we've actually, instead of just publishing it for ourselves, we published it for all of you. So you know what Barb does every week. That's what I do every week and when that's going on. Now with Barb, her schedule is fluid, and so she gets her hours in. You'll see she has 27 activities. I have 22 disciples. That was sort of a mess up on here. She's 22 regular tasks. It's 27 okay. regular tasks that she does every week for the church. And then you should feel free also to consult with any staff member about what they do because it's you all that keeps them doing what they're doing. And what we're doing is constantly trying to make room for 40, 50, 60 more people to be saved and brought into the church. And so that's basically what this is all about. It's on the back in, uh, where, the, where the counter is. And you just grab one of those if you want to look at that. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord my Father. There is no turning with pleasure to thee. 
Oh, change us not with thy passions, they fail not. And this is it forever will Amen, be. Amen, Julie, good. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. Great is thy faithfulness, nor God to me. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not, that thy passions they fail not. As it is forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. Thou as is need if thy hand hath provided. Thou is this faithfulness, Lord. If, if you do any farming at all, slip your hand up. Let me see. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Listen, fellas, those of you who do, um, I know you need two inches of rain. Pretty much too sweet. Why don't we come and pray together? Those who are farmers, others that would gather around them and help them. Brother Brad, why don't you come? Uh, that's right, Rob, come if you will. Come, fellas, and just get right here, and we're going to pray over you. We're going to pray that God will bring that rain uh, we did this the last time. Half an inch of rain came right away. Uh, we're just asking that the Lord will do it again. Brother Dyer, I know you have something to do with that as well. Why don't we just get down here on our knees and we'll ask the Lord right now to do uh, something special. Father, I know what it's like today to hear some of the misunderstandings about prayer. It happens over and over again. People don't seem to get it, what importune prayer is. And yet, Lord, that definition in the Word of God is very clear. We see in the Scriptures over and over again the people of God coming together and praying demonstratively up in rooms, in areas out in the streets, with individuals here and there in the temple, we see them going up into the temple to pray. They're not just doing it in their homes. They're doing it in the temple. They're doing it in places that are public. And so what we're doing here has biblical precedent. It's exactly what the Scripture says the early church did. And so we're coming to you demonstratively in front of your people, in front of those on Facebook saying, we believe our God. We believe you. And we believe in faith that you can you want and we're asking for you to bring two inches of rain enough for the people to have what they need in their farms and for you dear lord to be glorified during this dry time and you will be lord the last time we all glorified you for sending that rain we want to glorify you again and lord we'll glorify you no matter what you do jesus gave us that example let this cup pass from me it didn't and yet he still glorified you with His death. And so we do give you the praise and the honor no matter what, but our hearts are stirred and you've asked us to do it. You've told us we can do it. You've said, bring to me any request, anything. You've told us to ask and we would receive. And so we're asking you, Father, please, to bring the rain and to glorify yourself and make us, dear Lord God, to be insignificant when it comes to this. Most certainly no one here, we maintain our own insignificance. No one here thinks that just because we are doing this prayer, that somehow you have to do what we say. You're not our little puppy dog. 
We ask you, Father God, with great reverence and great fear of you and great submission. We ask you, dear Lord God, with great royalty and loyalty before you to say, Lord, do what you want, but help us, Lord. We need your help. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Love you all. Love you guys. You start in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. You already know we're going to end up in Luke 11. But you can look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 2. We'll end up, like I say, in chapter 11 of Luke. Luke chapter 11. But we're starting in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 2. Would you read this out loud with me just to start with? but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the Word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. We were in Sunday school today, and I started to work with the people in Sunday school by saying to them, listen, If in church, or in your music, or in the way you serve the Lord, in what you do, even in announcements, or in the hymns, or anything in our church, it becomes a mantra, or if it becomes repetitive, you've heard of a 7-Eleven song, you know, seven words sung 11 times, you've heard this, right? If that is what's going on in your relationship to the Lord, can I just tell you, it's, it's probably false stuff. It's mantra-like. And that is actually spoken of in the Scriptures when it says doctrines of devils. Okay, Doctrines of devils. You say, why, Pastor? Because straightly translated, not just in Greek, but also in the Hebrew, when you study the devil, he has music in his being. The Word of God tells you he has organs. The Word of God calls it taburines. All right, tabrets. And those tabrets are drums, is what it is. It's just boom, boom, boom. It's repetitive. Boom, but a bump, but a bump, but a bump, but a bump. And what it's called is mantra like behavior. All right, mantra like behavior. It's the stuff you wake up to at three o'clock in the morning and say, man, it's still in my head, you know. <laughs> I mean, if you know what I'm talking about, all right, yes, of course. Now, here's the problem with mantra like worship it doesn't jive with relationships, okay? It doesn't jive with relationships. With my wife, I don't have a mantra marriage. I hope you don't either. We don't get up in the morning and say, hello, good morning, I love you. We're going to say I love you 15 times today. I love you, I love you, I love you. Good morning. You're a good little wife. Let me pat you on the head. What is that? Well, it's computer-like. Neither do we constantly, emotionally relate to one another. How many of you know what I mean when I say the charismatic movement? You've heard of the charismatic movement. The charismatic movement is famous for mantra worship. All right? And yet they've pulled Baptists and Christian churches and Bible churches into that mantra-like worship with this, you know. The other day, somebody filmed me doing that. I had a Bible, at a preacher's Bible conference, and then they posted it. So I was going. <laughs> All the preachers were like, well, we know what he's all about. <laughs> now, is it cultish to look at things that historically have been damaging to the church and try to avoid them? No, of course not. You say, well, pastor, is it just about music? No, it's about everything. It's about the preaching style. It's about when somebody gets up to preach and they say the same things 11 times, you know? The same thing over and over. It, it becomes mantra-like. You get home and you're like, ha ah, that one phrase is stuck in my head. Now, 
the ministry of repetition is a thing. And Peter talks about the ministry of repetition in the Word of God. There's nothing wrong with that. But what I'm saying is the way that it's stated is vital. Now, why do I tell you this? It's because churches have gotten into the Lord's Prayer and believed that they're actually doing something by saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done. It doesn't mean anything. I mean, people are looking at their watches and thinking about their bologna sandwiches while they're praying the Lord's Prayer because it's a mantra to them. They know what the next words are. It hasn't become deep to them. Listen, don't let your marriage, don't let your relationships, don't let anything in your life become emotional or mantra-based. Just don't do it. That's why I stay away from rock and roll music, even if it has Christian words. Why, Pastor? Well, it's I'll tell you. Some of the themes of this Christian rock and roll music is awesome. I mean, these guys come up with some great concepts. And I flip over to the bridge once in a while, and I'll listen, I'll say, man, that is a good idea. But it becomes so mantra-like. I find myself singing the words without thinking about what they even mean. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Now, this is what happens even in this church. Why? Because hymns can be mantra-like, right? <laughs> hymns can be mantra You say, oh, pastor, you're attacking the hymn. No, I'm not. I'm saying your mindset about hymns needs to be pure enough that it's relationship-based rather than charismatic in nature. That's all I'm saying. They say, well, you get all over the guys with... No, I'm getting all over all of us, okay? <laughs> Why? Because the first problem in the room is Barry Seekers. The first problem in our area is First Baptist Church. The first problem among any denominational detail are Baptist churches. We are the object here. We are struggling to stay away from mantra-based behavior. So we're not attacking anyone. We're self-examining. Do you see? So you pray with me, because I need that. I need to not be false in the way I teach your messages. It needs to be Bible. It needs to be relational. It doesn't need to be charismatic or mantra-like. It doesn't need to be emotional. You know, if you finish a message, and you're in tears, and you're broken, and you're just a mess, and you come down to this altar, and you throw it all on the altar, and you're snotting and slobbering all over the place, and you leave here, and you yell at your wife and kick your dog, then you didn't learn anything. Emotion meant nothing at that point. You see where I'm going with this now? So what do we got to do? We've got to allow God to get into us and passionately deal with our hearts relationally. You know how I got saved? Not through a mantra. Because if it's through a mantra, you know this, right? Then it's just a useless prayer. Dear Jesus, forgive me for my sins. Come to my heart. Clean me from my sins. I repent. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I got to tell you something. Yesterday, Vince came into my office. There he is right there. Everybody love on him, won't you? Love on him. We love you, Vince. Come on, man. Have a seat. Wherever you want. Have a seat. Vince came into my office yesterday and without a mantra of any kind, he just gave his heart to Jesus Christ. He did it simply. He did it wisely. And I'm telling you, Vince, this is the truth. Five minutes before we got into that prayer, you were still saying things like, well, you've got to be baptized to be saved. Five minutes after you said that prayer, you said, I am a thousand percent sure I'm saved because of the blood of Jesus Christ and nothing else. And he was telling me that. He was telling me that. So let me ask you something. Is it not true that in a second, in a split second, people get saved? I mean, they get saved in a split second. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4 says our minds are blind. And all of a sudden, they're released from all that blindness. Now, when I was a young man, I had a neighbor. His name was Jeffrey Hastings. All right? You can be going to Luke chapter 11 now. Luke chapter 11. Jeffrey Hastings. And I had such a good friendship with this kid. Probably a better friendship than I should have had. Okay? How many of you have had friendships that you thought, 
I shouldn't be so close to this guy. You know what I'm saying? He's getting me into trouble. <laughs> this was the kind of guy that he was. So Jeffrey, my heart was breaking for him because I knew the truth. As a young man, I knew the truth. I was probably about 10 or 11 years old at the time. And I remember going out into my yard with him. We were playing and talking. And he said, I don't believe in God at all. And I thought, oh my goodness, he doesn't believe in God. You're in Luke chapter 11 and verse 1, Jack, if you will. And I thought to myself, oh no, he doesn't believe in God. So you know what I did? I said, Jeff, let's get down on our knees. Because, you know, you need to get saved. So we talked about salvation some, and, and then I did something really stupid. I say, Pastor, you don't ever do anything stupid. <laughs> you all know I do, don't you? Anyway, st- nothing's changed since I was 10. But anyway, at 10, 11 years old, I got down on my knees, and I was wanting to pray with him. And he said, no, I don't, I don't believe in all this. I said, Jeff, he could come back at any time. Matter of fact, I think the heavens are opening. Maybe Jesus is coming back. What was that? What was that? That was precisely what we saw in that passage of Scripture a moment ago, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 2. What, what, What did we see? Deception. Wicked deception. And this is all over, not just in churches outside of these walls, but within our own midst. I'm concerned. I'm concerned that anyone that would get into this pulpit would try to deceive people in some way to get closer to God. But it's got to be based in fact. It's got to be based in Bible. It's got to be based in historical context. It's got to be based in, get this, you ready? Here we go. Truth. It must be the truth. Tuesday, we have prayer night. My prayer is that you'd start coming. You say, well, why, Pastor? Because prayer, truthfully, is one of the reasons this church continues to go. Prayer is vital to this church. Brother Jeff O'Day is going to be helping us starting a program in the next six months of prayer. And Brother Jeff O'Day has some things that I believe are going to be a help to us. He's a great gentleman. I'm just talking with him about giving him my ideas. But he is a prayer guy. You know that? How many of you know there are gals and guys in our church that are just the prayer guy, you know? (laughs) And so Jeff is one of those prayer guys. And prayer is important because, why? Because what Christ prayed about generally happened. (laughs) What Christ prayed about generally happened. Now, everything Christ agreed with, with his Father, came to pass. You ever thought about this? Look with me at Luke 11, verse 1. What does the first five words say? Isn't that interesting? You see, Jesus Christ makes things happen. (laughs) How many of you know this? And it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place. When he ceased, now can I tell you this? Jesus Christ is the impetus for things that we don't know he's doing in us before we realize it. And what I mean by that is providentially, in, on Wednesday night, and I didn't tell you this, Vince, I don't believe. But when we left here, you were here on Wednesday. And when we left here, I got in the car and I was driving home and I said, God, that man's heart is so hard. Can you please save his soul? And three days later, he's saved. Let me ask you something. Does God answer prayer? I'm not the only one that was praying, so I had a very small part in that. But as I prayed, it dawned on me on Saturday, oh my goodness, Vince just got saved. I mean, it didn't hit me. The connection didn't get made. I was talking to Cindy last night, and it dawned on me, oh my goodness, it really happened. It really happened what I prayed happened. Praise God Almighty, that happened. Now, as I was talking to Cindy, I said, I've got to tell you, that was providence, because God already knew I was going to pray that prayer, and He may have even, I believe He did, incite it. <laughs> he incited it. 
Isn't that crazy? He incites the prayer. He answers the prayer. And then He becomes the object of the glory of the prayer. He incites the prayer. He acts on it, makes it happen, and then He gets all the glory for it. And we sit down and we go, I prayed about that. Oh, I had nothing to do with that. (laughs) God just made it happen in His providence because God is huge. He's awesome. He's powerful. Now understand this about prayer this morning. He was praying in a certain place. And when He stopped, one of His disciples said unto Him, Lord, Teach us to pray. You know what? God, through Jesus Christ, incited His disciples to ask Him how He could teach them to pray. Now, all of that excitement cannot be stripped away and made into this mechanical, Our Father, which art in heaven. Come on. Is that really what He wanted? I'm going to tell you, that little mantra doesn't do anything for us. Any more than a boom, but a boom, but a boom is going to help you get close to God. Any more than a hymn would help you to get close to God. If it's mantra like, if it's just repetitive, it's the same thing over and over. I've heard that hymn a thousand times. Well, you know what, my friends? If you are thinking of it properly and your heart is in tune with the Almighty God of Heaven, some of those older hymns will draw you in doctrinally to the Spirit of the King of Kings more than you could ever imagine. It is heartbreaking that we took the Lord's Prayer and made it a mantra. But, as you go on, you'll see in verse 2, He said unto them, When ye pray. What words? What words, right? In the moment of your prayer, in the time of your prayer, when you're about to ready to do this, He says, Our Father, this is what you want to say. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You know the one thing that our culture knows about the word hallowed as demonic. What is Halloween? It literally means all hallows Eve. Is there an Eve that's hallowed? Can I tell you something? There's only one person in the entire universe that should be hallowed. What do you mean? Pastor, what does hallowed mean? I don't get it. It means made holy. That's what it means, period. Are you going to tell me that sometime in October... That there's an evening that ought to be made holy? I tell you something, my friends. God is holy. He is holy, holy, holy. Say, what other things are holy? Anything God touches. (laughs) Anything God does. Any way He gets all the glory is a holy thing. Any way He gets all the glory is a holy thing. I don't know that he gets all the glory by me dressing up like Dracula. I just don't. Blood running down my face. Walking around looking like... (laughs) This is holy. I tell you what, that's not all Hallow's Eve. All Hallow's Eve is when all the saints of God get down their face before the Lord and start to weep and revival sets in. Now that's an all Hallow's Eve right there. But these other things are not hallowed. He says this, Our Father which art in heaven, what is it? Made holy be thy name. Made holy be thy name. Thy kingdom needs to what? How many want Jesus to come back? How many are ready for the kingdom to start? You say, Pastor, we're in the kingdom. I don't believe that. I believe that when we're in the kingdom, there's going to be a whole lot more perfection than we're seeing right now everywhere around us. I believe that wars are going to stop. I believe the Spirit is going to take over. I believe He's going to rule and reign with a rod of iron. I believe exactly what the Word of God says. You know why? Because Christ is perfect and we are not. And when Christ is in charge, truly, things will become holy. 
hallowed. He says this, he says, hey, start praying that his kingdom would. Well, Jesus was here. The kingdom hadn't come. Still hadn't come. He says this, thy will be done as in heaven. In this earth, thy will be done as in heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done as in heaven, so on the earth. Now, right now, right now, is God's will done on earth as it is in heaven? Are we in the kingdom? Will we be? Oh yes, we sure will. You see how much great teaching and theology there is in the Lord's Prayer? And here we are. Our Father, which are in heaven, I won't be learning. My kingdom come, I will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Everybody's like. <laughs> you go on to verse 3, it says this. Give us day by day our daily bread. You say, Pastor, you selected one of the Gospels that's not the norm of the prayer. I did that on purpose to show you something. God will teach us His prayer in His way for the right purposes. Now you understand purpose, the word purpose. Day by day. Just think of that word, Chris. For those, there you go. Day by day. How many of us realize that somehow... Eight billion people on earth are surviving. Does this ever get into you and make you think? And sometimes they'll survive 60 years. Sometimes they'll survive 80 years. Sometimes they'll survive 105 years. You know why? Because day by day, God provides daily bread. Now some people go without eating, and they don't do it because they want to. I lived in Uruguay where people would drink a mate one day. Mate was a tea that they had. And the next day they had enough to eat. And that went on sometimes regularly in people's lives. So don't get to where you start to thinking, wow, three, five, 15 meals a day, that's just normal. Might be normal for you, sweetheart. But it's not normal all over the world. How many of you know that? Now, understand that it's a prayer. And it's a prayer for God's people because God, get this, Jose. God in this passage is saying, pray to me that I nourish you. Wow, this is cool, isn't it? Pray to me that... He's actually encouraging us to pray to Him to nourish ourselves. Day by day. Daily bread. I can't eat bread. I can't eat bread. So I eat things that are more fattening than bread. Now, the point that I'm making to you is, in this passage of Scripture, if we get to where we're legalistic about it, they say, oh, God wants us to pray to eat bread every day. Well, this passage is saying nourishment. Nourishment. Anything. Now, look with me at verse 4. I want to understand this with you. Forgive us our sins. Oh, man. Whew. Forgive us our sins. Forgive us our sins. Put Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3 up, won't you? Forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3 says, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem be other better than themselves. Now, day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute, do we generally think everyone else in the world is better than me? If we have a number one problem in American society, it is, I take care of number one. 
I got my house, my things, my car. Somebody needs five dollars. They can just need it. <laughs> Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. How does this strife? How does this <clears throat> unrest start happening? Because in lowliness of mind, we don't esteem everyone else as better than ourselves. When you talk to somebody and they say, listen, I don't, want to have you do any, I don't have anything to do with you. Do you think that they are following this passage? I don't want to talk to you. I have nothing to do with you. You are less than the lessest. You have done this. You have broken trust. You hear this all the time? I got news for you. You're no better, okay? So knock it off. Knock it off. You say, yeah, but different people. No, no, they're not. You're just a wicked, stinking, rotten sinner like everybody else. Am I wrong about that? So stop going around saying, I haven't talked to them for four years because they had a hangnail and broke off my foot and they stepped on it. So I don't talk to them anymore. Forget about it. What keeps me from forgetting about it? I hear it whispered. Why don't we just say it? Pride. We are arrogant. Americans are arrogant people. In fact, I don't think I've ever been in any part of the world that's not. <laughs> Uruguayans are arrogant. Cubans are arrogant. Everywhere I've ever been, I see this. Oh, man. As you say, well, among those poor, you know, humble folk, there are no humble folk. They don't exist. <laughs> Let nothing be done through what? Or vainglory. But in lowliness of mind, do what? You're better than me, Dad. You are. You're better than me, Oscar. You're better than me. You're better than me. You're better than me, Jose. You are. You're better than me. See, this is what we're talking about. I had a guy tell me <laughs> a few months ago. He said, you're misinterpreting that passage of Scripture. I said, I'm reading that passage of Scripture. You're misinterpreting it. Yeah. Because it really does mean to make yourself what? Lowly. Lowly. Less than others. Right. So what does that do? Well, let's go back to our main text here in Luke chapter 11 and verse 4, I believe now. Luke chapter 11 and verse 4. Forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Uh, I, I, I really struggle with this. And I hope, I hope that you don't take it wrong. Please don't take this wrong. I really, really struggle with this. I have to get up and tell you all the things that are wrong while I'm doing them. That's hard. That's hard. How many of you know your pastor is arrogant too? How many of you know your pastor's proud? I had a lady the other day write to me. <laughs> this was so funny to me. She said, you are <laughs> she said, you are such a humble man. And I thought, oh, honey, you just don't see me in private. That's all there is to it. You don't see me every day. You don't see uh, what you should know is that I'm not. You say, well, you're talking about it. That proves I'm not. Yeah. Wrong? Yeah. That's right. You know, I'm talking about humility and how that I'm not humble. What does that indicate to you? I feel like I need to talk about myself. And what is that? What is it? Pride. So don't get to where you're thinking, 
Oh, what a humble man. <laughs> I tell you what I am, an arrogant cuss. That's what I am. And the scripture says here, we forgive one another. Yes, we're indebted to one another. But lead us not into this temptation, but deliver us from evil. If you go to James chapter 1 for just a moment, understand what the Bible's saying here in verse 13. James chapter 1 and verse 13. We've got to really be careful not to point our fingers up to God and say, you know what? If I'm tempted, if I'm tempted, then it must be because God's doing that. There are some things God doesn't do. There are some things God can't do. A bunch of people got the idea that God can do anything. How many of you believe that? Can God sin? Then God can't do everything. And He can't fail. And He can't, look at this, He can't tempt. There's a whole series of things He can't do. Look at this, let no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God. For God, what? Just right there, the, the next word. God, all right, get this. There are things God cannot do. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he by choice, neither tempteth he any man. So what is my problem? Well, I'm tempted when I am what? Verse 14. Every man then is tempted when I am myself drawn away of his own lust and enticed, proud, arrogant, conceited, Barry Seacrest. Proud, arrogant, conceited, Barry Seacrest. Say, so, Pastor, what are you getting at here with going through all this? We're getting there. Look at verse 5. He said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend? And go unto him at midnight. And say unto him, Friend! Lend me some gluten. You know, the Bible talks about gluten all the time. I just love bread. I love bread. I would bathe in bread. But it would have to have big, thick, buttery butter on it. Like big, thick, buttery butter. Mmm, I love bread. You know, they make bread out of rice. And they make bread out of uh, all kinds of dumb stuff. You know what I'm saying? Cauliflower pizza. What a dumb idea. It's a terrible idea. Well, good for you. I'm glad you love it. You know what? I want real bread with wheat in it. You know what Jeff O'Day is harvesting this morning? Wheat. 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 <laughs> So he comes and he says, lend me three loaves. I'm like, lend me 50 loaves, okay? Lend me 100 loaves. I need the loaves. Verse 6. For a friend of mine in his, in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, leave me alone. This is what that means in the Seacrest vernacular. Trouble me not. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him, because he's his friend, you know. Listen, I'm in bed right now. This right now, we're, we're, we're envisioning 11.15 at night, okay? You've been asleep for an hour and a half. In that culture, everybody slept in the same bed. They're all in bed with their kids. They're asleep. He's like, listen, you're waking up my wife. You're waking up my kids because you're waking up me. And he selfishly says, I'm not going to give you this bread. I'm not going to give you. Man, he's withholding wheat. You know, you know. I know what it's like to be withheld wheat, all right? Ask my wife, Barbara, okay? She's the culprit. Every time I want to eat something, she's like, well, if you want to have a headache, go ahead and eat that. Some of you don't know I have to be gluten-free because I get these weird headaches about 36 hours after I eat gluten. And sometimes it doesn't happen, so it fools me, and I'm like, I'm cured! So I eat a bunch, and then I'm sick, you know? I love bread. And he says, you can't have it. You can't have it. You're not allowed to have it. 
11.15 at night. I am not getting up. You can forget it. Because I may be your friend, but I'm not coming down there. And yet, the guy keeps on. Come on. Come on. Come on. You know what the word importunity straightly translated is? Shameless. You knew that? Shameless. Shameless. Because of the shamelessness of this man. Give me bread. 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 I need bread. Give me bread. Give me Okay. I'll come and I'll give you bread. Now, I was taught wrong about this. Somebody told me that importunity was more similar to the need itself because he really needed it. That's not here. That's not in the text. I say, so all you got to do is just uselessly, quietly say to God, Lord, I need a piece of bread. And He'll give it to you. That's not what this text is saying. What this text is saying is, you become a stinking rotten jerk to God, okay? <laughs> and you start to say it over and over. God, give me souls! God, give me souls. God, save souls at my hand. God, do special things. God, move in me. God, move in our church. God, move in my family. Save my wife. Save my husband. Move on me. Oh, God, pour your spirit down upon me. Oh, Lord, God. And on my knees, saying it to him, shamelessly talking to him, saying, God, please bring the fire. God, please bring the rain. God, please bring your power upon this church. You say, Pastor, you just talked about emotionalism. I didn't say anything about your closet. Go to your closet and be as emotional as you want, okay? Get in there and just plead with the Almighty God of Heaven. And when you're here in public, you may not want to snot and spit and cry all over the place, but I have right here at these altars, quietly. My friends, I don't want there to be any display of indecency. The Word of God tells us in 1 Corinthians 14 that would be wrong because everything in this church needs to be run decently and in order. I get that. Everything needs to be decent and in order. But man, we have got to break through the veneer of trying to be somehow educated. Dear Lord, our Father which art in heaven, what are we doing here? And so Jesus says this, don't take my prayer and make it a mantra. Be importune. Be shameless in your prayer. My daughter Rochelle understands being shameless. Verse 8 says, I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he's friend, Yet because of his shamelessness, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. As many. Listen to that. Wow. A hundred loaves, Brother Michael. Yes. And butter too. Hmm. My daughter Rochelle understands it. Yes, Rochelle. This is at our door. At our... How many of you guys know your bedroom doors, our doors, my dad's door? She's shameless. Dad, can I have a popsicle? No, you can't have a popsicle. Ten minutes later. Dad, do I have to go to bed yet? No, you don't have to go to bed. Can I have a popsicle? We just told you you couldn't have a popsicle. Rochelle, you're supposed to be in bed. Can I have a popsicle? It helped me to sleep if I had a popsicle. <laughs> Question for you today, Christian brother, sister. Are you shameless before God? Are you shameless before God? Hey, hey, look, listen. Are you shameless before God? Question I have for you. If... You are wanting something from God. What does He say you need to be? You need to ask. You need to be shameless. Tonight, in the next text, starting in verse 9, going down to verse 13, you're going to see four things that you can do. Four methods that will cause you 
to get your prayers answered. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes and just think for a moment. Am I what God wants me to be in this shameless department? Am I what God wants me to be in this importune attitude? Have I done that? Some will say to me, I want my daughter to be saved. But what they've done every day, every morning is, Dear Lord God, save my daughter. Let me get on with my day. Next morning, Dear Lord God, save my daughter. Let me get on with my day. My friends, that's mantra, not importunity. And there's a massive difference. And the question I have for you is, are you really wanting her saved? Are you really wanting your grandparents saved? Are you really wanting that healing that you need? Are you really wanting God to do some things that are beyond comprehension? Are you really wanting to see real revival at First Baptist Church? Are you really wanting to see things that you've prayed for in a mantra type way? Do you really want them? Do you want them? Do you desire them? Are you broken about it? Say, Pastor, I just don't think that the Bible teaches that. You don't? Why don't you turn to James chapter 4 during this invitation time? Think with me about this. Verse 8 says, Draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. And let your laughter be turned to mourning. Let your joy be turned to heaviness. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. My friends, this is importunity. This is shamelessness. This is snot on the carpet. This is tears all over the place. This is my God, please, oh God, please. God, please, please, please. Have you done that? Would you stand, dear brother or sister? If you're here today and you're not 100% sure you're saved, I tell you, Jesus Christ's words ring true for you as well. Today, you can come before Him and just say, My God, I need you to save me. I'm sorry about my 